Okay, is this working fine? All right. Welcome everyone to uh, this panel on the uh, slightly esoteric subject of greed and uh, human aspiration. We have a first-rate panel to debate this. I was hoping that the introducer would do a little more by way of introducing uh, each of the panelists, but uh, let me just do that very quickly. I have uh, Ambi Parmeswaran here, who's been the executive director of Ulka, the advertising agency, and he's also the uh, author of several books, the most recent of which is something called N Nudes and Noodles. Is that? Nawab's. Sorry, Nawab's Nudes and Noodles. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, Dipankar Gupta, of course, uh, the well-known uh, sociologist and writer, Gurcharan Das, uh, who's uh, again been in the world of uh, capital, so to speak. He's been the CEO of Procter & Gamble, and uh, he's also the uh, author of several books. Uh, we have with us uh, Lord Stephen Green, who's, in a sense, straddled both the worlds of high finance as well as of government. He's been uh, associated with several banking institutions in England, and he's also served as trade minister in the, the Tory government. And uh, last but not least, we have Arun Mehra, who's a former member of Planning Commission, a writer, a thought leader. So uh, we have an excellent panel with, as you can tell, a lot of gender diversity. Uh, well, well represented. Okay, so the way that uh, we thought we'd set it up is that we'd get each of our panelists to do a short three-minute kind of opening statement, and then we can take it into a conversation. Now, we were just trying to think of what could be a context for discussing greed, and we're not quite sure what that context was that the organizers had in mind, but I suppose one recent context which sums up the paradoxical nature of the concept of greed as something which on one hand is seen as, as, you know, as Gordon Gekko, the famous Michael Douglas speech in, in Wall Street said, was reflective of the surge of human ambition that it, it cuts through, it clarifies, and in a sense, it, it marks that upward movement. And on the other is something that actually foments and exacerbates divisions, whether it's social, whether it's economic, or whether it has to do with its impact on the climate. And I suppose the recently concluded World Economic Forum at Davos best sums up that paradox, because that's where the world's rich and famous and powerful gather to celebrate the fact that the world economy is now finally growing, I'm told at an average of about 4%. But it's also the same gathering where Oxfam, the UK-based charity, releases its annual report on growing world inequality. And the latest report says that 82% of the wealth created last year went to the richest 1%, and the poorest 80% get nothing. So on that note, let me hand over and start with you, uh, Ambi Parmeswaran, by asking you that advertisement or advertisers, in a sense, prey on greed and is driven by greed. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, well, so no. So I spent, you expect me to say anything else? Right. So I spent the last, whatever, 40 years. Okay, that's of a my, short answer. Yeah. Uh, 40 years of my life in marketing, branding, and advertising. Uh, and I believe advertising is a force of good because we are about building uh, human aspirations. Uh, where do you draw the line between human aspirations and greed? I think the learned panel will debate that. But let's look at aspirations and what my book also looks at, how the Indian society has changed over the last 50 years and how brands have reflected the change in society. Uh, for example, take the most humble of humble products uh, which have been advertised in India, uh, which had a very famous line which some of my older friends here would remember, Jo BV Se Kare Pyar, right? So there was a humble, pres I mean, humble pressure cooker, which was advertised with that line, Jo BV Se Kare Pyar, O Prestige Se Kaise Kare Inkar. If you, I mean, that's the most, you're talking about gender diversity, that's probably the most <laughs> uh, biased view of women, right? If you really right. love if you, if your you wife. Just quickly translate that yeah, for So if you really love your wife, what do you buy her? You buy her a good pressure cooker, 
right? <laughs> this was an ad which ran on Indian television not way back. It was, ran in 1982. And it ran for something like five years. And it, it, and it and, yeah, and it still works because, you know, you can go and cry from the rooftop about how a pressure cooker saves energy, saves time, etc. But finally, to get the husband to buy the pressure cooker for his wife, the ad said, if you really love your wife, buy her this 100% safe pressure cooker. And that one ad probably did more for spreading the pressure cooker culture in this country than anything which the government has been doing, saying that cook with a pressure cooker, save energy. Now, is that, is that greed? Is that human aspiration? I don't know. Or oh, look at another product. I think uh, this product should have actually spread wide in this country. Uh, a lot of young girls in India stop going to school uh, when they hit the, the uh, menstruation period, right? A and one of the reasons the acceptance or adoption of sanitary napkins in this country, and I think Gurchan and Das here was the company which is trying to market that product, could not spread hard enough in this country because the government of India, for whatever it is, for 20 years did not allow sanitary napkins on national television before 10 p.m. So you made sure all the young girls were asleep, and then you start advertising sanitary napkins. And today, if you look at the whole country, probably less than 20% of them use, 20% of the young girls use good quality sanitary napkins. I'm not saying advertising would have helped, but you know, somewhere it would have made a significant difference. Or take a product which, you know, I get the first part because I have nudes in my book's title, but there is also noodles. Right? So noodles in this country is a completely alien product. Okay? But it was spread right through the length and breadth of the country because of one company and one brand, Maggie. Right? And, and today, uh, it was originally positioned as a simple product which a mom can make when the kids come home from school hungry. Mommy, book lagi hai. Mom, I am hungry. And the mom says, two minutes, two minutes. And, and Maggie is done, it's made, it's served, and it went on, it was very well priced, it was nice and tasty, easy to make, well advertised, it became a huge, a huge product, okay? Now you can curse it, I mean some of you here may be cursing, it contains polyunsaturated fats, it is not healthy, blah, blah, blah. But the truth is, millions of young men and women living alone in India eat Maggie at least probably once or twice a week. And if you look at the other flip side, we actually need more Maggies in this country because 35,000 crores or several billion dollars worth of food grains in this country go waste because we have not encouraged processed foods. So I believe advertising helps human aspiration and uh, we help consumers discover new products, new services. And I think we are all about spreading the consumer culture for the good and bad, right? So I, I strongly believe that we are all about, in marketing, advertising, branding, we are about human aspiration. And you may call it greed, Vasu, but it is human aspiration. I'm not. Yeah, okay, it's human aspiration. We are okay. all about, you know, teaching consumers how to use a pressure cooker, how to use a mobile phone, how to use a computer, and, and okay, profiting from it, so what? We're making the life better, right? Okay, all right, Ambi. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna put a quick question to you before we move on, that your suggestion that there's a certain value-free idea to the notion of advertising, to the notion of selling products is interesting, because at the end of the day, when you say that you've taught or you've encouraged consumers to use a pressure cooker, even though the message is regressive, that's like saying that we've encouraged millions of young women to buy fair and lovely cream, because you've sent out the message that actually fairness is associated with beauty, is associated with aspiration. But you can turn around and say we've sold millions of tubes of fair and lovely. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so are you saying that there's a certain value, I mean, it's value agnostic. You don't, it's not necessarily that the message has to be empowering or it has to be socially useful. It's just about selling the product. Isn't okay. that then the a manifestation of a very... It's not a very benign idea of greed. Uh, let me go back to that era when, when prestige was a very popular advertising, okay? The advertising line for that time, if you really love your wife, you'll buy her a prestige pressure cooker, yeah. was right for that time. It's, it's idiotic today, right? You can't run that ad today. So what have they done? They, yeah, the manufacturer done an interesting thing. They've hired 
the biggest celebrity couple in the country, Abhishek ba uh, Bachchan and Aishwarya Rai. And now, Abhishek Bachchan is cooking for his wife using a pressure cooker, okay. which is prestige, which I think is a, is a nice turn of the story. Okay, right? all right. Uh, Deepankar Gupta, go for it. Well, uh, Mike, Mike. Well, you see, I, I, I partly agree with Ambi, uh, but it's also true that not every advertisement succeeds. Let's not uh, get the impression that just because you're advertising, you're going to hit the market. So many advertisers, they spend so much money and get nowhere. However, there's one point on which I think we are in agreement, and time will tell, and that is this, that in the past, we had a lot of greed. You know, people could, uh, some people could wear certain kinds of saris, certain kind of jewelry, and all of that was meant to distinguish yourself from the other. And there were poor people out there, or not even those who were not so poor, who dare not aspire to wear those clothes or to live that lifestyle. You may have heard in Rajasthan, even very recently, a young man, a uh, groom, was going to get married, and his entourage was dressed up like uh, Rajputs, uh, you know, usually donned themselves on such occasions, riding a horse, wearing a sword, and he was accosted by people saying, how dare you do this? Now, in a consumption culture, this is unheard of. In a, cons in, a, in a consumer society, everybody should be able to do everything. And I think in that sense, consumerism is, a, in a sense, an equalizer. In our country, we can't quite understand this very well because we get all wrapped up in issues of greed, aspiration, and so forth, little realizing that aspiration is really a factor that propels society forward. And it also helps us to relate to one another and not be so easily distinguishable. Now, what is luxury? Luxury really is the first stage of fashion. Luxury is something that you cannot afford, and fashion becomes something that you can afford or should be affordable. In our country, we don't have really fashion. We have luxury, we have style, we have no fashion, because we don't have a very strong middle class. But just think of it. Wherever you have a good fashion designer, that fashion designer doesn't really make clothes for a few. It is for the masses. So most people not know, just looking at a pair of jeans, whether this cost $100 or $20 or it's from Saroji Nagar, it's very difficult to make out. And that, I think, is the magic of consumerism, that you don't really know which class you belong to. And I have found that in many Western societies and in certain parts of India, but woefully in very small pockets, people don't want to stand out, and yet they want to look well turned out. And this combination is only possible with the consumer culture. Uh, Sears Roebuck <clears throat> had said that their style of ad advertising is that you should be able to touch, but you can't quite grasp. And then to make that transition from touch to grasp is where you must tighten your belt a bit to, 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 to be able to achieve that. Drudgery is something of the past, where people sort of you know, even felt drudgery was something noble. You worked very hard, you raised your children, you cook over a you know, wooden stove and stuff like that. Now what a, a cons consumerism does, or what aspiration does, it takes you away from drudgery. And that is a very important thing. Why should drudgery be the lot of women day after day after day? Why can't we move out of that? So instead of thinking of the pressure cooker as a symbol of sexism of some kind, why don't we see the pressure cooker as a symbol of moving away from drudgery? And this is what people want. The okay. drudgery they should leave in the past and somehow move into the present. When Thorsten Weblin, years and years ago, wrote his book on the leisure class, that book did well in his time in the 1920s. Today, it makes no sense. Because in the West, most people don't want to stand out like they did during Thorsten Weblin's time. Unfortunately, in our country, the rich want to stand out and look different. This is how things were, let's say, in Europe. In Paris, you know, you wove feathers and you had uh, all kinds of primary on your clothes okay. and you had to uh, you know, stand out. And right. along came Coco Chanel who changed everything. I think this is what consumerism should really be about. Thank okay. You. All right. Uh, Gurcharan Das, let me uh, uh, hand over to you. Now, you've written about the idea of the dharma of capitalism, that, that you argue that capitalism in itself should not be tarnished in an oversimplified way as something which is necessarily harmful, but there's something 
inherently self-corrective about it? Well, you know, uh, I think part of the problem we have in that title of this session, the use of the word greed, is really a confusion in language. And the person who clarified that best was Adam Smith, the founder, as it were, the intellectual founder of capitalism. And he talked about the difference between self-interest mm -hmm. and selfishness. And he said, well, you know, we are all self-interested. We want to buy things uh, cheaply. We want to sell them expensively. He said that if it rains, we take an umbrella. Well, there's nothing greedy about that. It's just very human uh, behavior. And though, therefore, a lot of the criticism of the market is based on a ling this linguistic uh, confusion. And there's another confusion which we make, and that is the way that we must make the confusion between being pro-market and pro-business. In fact, being pro-market is to be in favor of cap competition with lots of players who compete with each other, and as a result, costs come down, prices come down, quality of product improves. Whereas a business, being pro-business, no businessman likes competition. And so the businessman inherently opposes the market. And this is the other confusion that we make about the market. And the, think of a third counterfactual. You know, you have a quotation of Socrates in a description of this yeah. program. And think of the counterfactual when Socrates famous spoke his famous words 2,500 years ago. What if we had actually believed in what Socrates said? That would have meant no innovations, no inventions, no electricity, no medicines. Our lifespan would be 19 years instead of 90 years. So there is, I think, really ultimately the people who criticize capitalism, and there is much to criticize. The best book actually was by an American at Harvard named Daniel Bell, who talked about the cultural contradictions of capitalism. Right. He said in the first, when capitalism begins, in the first generation, there is frugality, there is the Protestant ethic, that there is hard work, but as the second generation and the third generation feel comfortable, they move into a culture of consumerism, right. and some of that is lost. Yes. And, and so I would just say that it's, it's not really either or. It's not, it's not, there is an element, I mean, I'm not saying that greed does not exist, but don't conflate it with capitalism. Okay. It, it, it don't confuse the, um, the market with business. Don't confuse um, being self-interested and carrying an umbrella with selfishness, which is when you are actually trampling on somebody's okay. um, feet or somebody's health. All so right. it's, a, it's partly a linguistic problem, I think, that we should clarify. All right, okay. Let me uh, go to you, Arun Mehra, first, and then I'll come to Stephen Green, that to Gurcharan's point, that don't conflate capitalism and greed, and also to the point about how you draw that balance between, on one hand, associating greed with a certain form of consumerism, which also leads to growth, which also leads to jobs, but on the other hand, you don't also want it to become a force that sharpens inequalities. As someone who's been in government, where does the state's role come in then in trying to, to mediate to ensure that you maintain that balance? Thank you very much, Reem. Um, in fact, I, 
promptly began to take notes as soon as uh, uh, my, my friend and my guru, uh, Gurcharan, made some startling uh, revelations where he said that uh, markets are good, but business is bad. Okay, and um, markets no, don't I just create that. themselves. Well, they're not as good as, that, business is not as yeah, good as markets. It was the difference between being pro-market and pro-business. Okay, that was the I should be pro-market, I should not be pro-business, because obviously because, market is better than business. Yeah. But businesses so don't like the market. Yes, the point businesses I was don't like markets, and markets are created by governments. Governments create the rules of property rights, of honoring contracts and the imposition of contracts, and governments create good markets. Anti-competition behavior is what governments regulate, okay? Uh, and so when we say that we want to be pro-market, we don't automatically, in fact, we should not be anti-government. And so therefore, I thought a lovely one when you talked about uh, the market works when the government sleeps at night. In fact, I think the market gets destroyed if the government is not working. But let me come to greed and, uh, and uh, aspiration. Greed, we associate usually with things that money can buy. So advertisers help to open up the wallets of people who use money, and businesses will grow. Aspiration, we associate, I associate with things that we value but which money perhaps cannot buy. We have greed for wealth. With wealth, you have opportunities to create more wealth, more greed, more wealth. With wealth, I can provide opportunities to my children that those who don't have wealth will not have. So I succeed in competition too. With wealth, oh, we can buy fame. Advertise, show ourselves off and buy fame. With wealth, you can buy power also to influence the rules of the game. And the US Supreme Court's decision recently, uh, a couple of years ago, that the freedom of speech decision, that you can use as much money as you have to influence the political discourse and, and politics. Okay, it's using wealth to get more power. The WTO, richer nations have more power to influence the rules of the game. Now, on the other side, aspirations for a better world in which everyone has equal opportunity, whether they are rich or poor, whether they have money to spend and buy things or not, a world in which everyone has equal dignity, and Dipankar touched upon that, okay? And it doesn't go away with the consumerism. You're denied what you believe is your right because you're not treated as equal, considered equal. We have aspirations for a world of compassion, kindness, community, peace, harmony. These are not things that money can buy. So I say greed is very much associated with wealth, money wealth, whereas aspirations are associated with much bigger things that humanity is searching for. There are two different paradigms of governance, and I come now to markets and, and business uh, um, and democracy. First, the paradigm which is in the world of capital, which is based on property rights as being an essential part of good governance. And in this world, if you have one dollar, it gives you one vote. If you have a million dollars, it gives you a million votes. And systems of corporate governance are designed like that. The majority shareholders should have. After all, it's more their property to determine what shall be done with that whole asset. Whereas, in the world of democracy, even if you have zero wealth, you have one vote. One heart, one life, one vote. These are two different paradigms of governance based on two different fundamental values and principles. And when you know, as, as engineers or even us, uh, or common people, that if you take an appliance which is designed to run on AC current, and plug it into a socket that is giving you DC current, something is going to blow up. And what is happening in the world today yes. is we've got systems of governance designed for greed and property rights and wealth, which are encountering and clashing with another human aspiration for systems which are more democratic in their, in their governance. OK. All right. Um, that sets us up very nicely uh, for Stephen Green. Oops.
That's called a mic drop uh, <laughs> by young people. Uh, Stephen Green, again, if you can try to also make the discussion something which doesn't become too lodged in the realm of economic theory. We want to make this as accessible as possible. Uh, you know, the same point about the idea that, as uh, Arun Mehra puts it, that there is something broken in the manner in which the system works, the system broadly, meaning those that's meant to serve the people. As someone who's been on both sides of the fence, in the private sector and in the government, where do you see the ability of the state to intervene to ensure that the balance is struck? Well, I, uh, first of all, let me say it's a great pleasure to be here in this beautiful climate instead of cold and miserable London at the moment. And uh, um, I wanted to pick up just initially on your reference to Adam Smith. Um, Adam Smith is well known as the great prophet of market capitalism, but he was absolutely not naive about the way capitalism works. And uh, uh, a couple of quotations which may or may not be familiar to you. First of all, his famous comment that it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their self-interest. Your point about self-interest rather than selfishness, although I suspect that it's hard to draw a line, a, a sharp line between self-interest and selfishness. But he was clearly not naive because he also said uh, that people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but that the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public interest. And finally, in a uh, quotation which is prescient when you think that this is the 18th century, um, and when we know what happened in the 20th century as people tried alternatives to liberal market capitalism, uh, he had a warning against persons who seem to imagine uh, that they can arrange the different members of society with as much ease as the hand moves pieces on a chessboard. In other words, he had a very clear understanding of the dilemma that we face. Uh, on the one hand, you need that uh, drive of self-interest, you can call it greed, and sometimes it looks like greed, and sometimes it is greed, um, the, 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 the temptation to try and fix the market, and that's the point about the difference between business and the markets, um, and at the same time the difficulty for the state or for the public policy domain of regulating all this such that it doesn't produce abuse. Um, there's one other quotation from Adam Smith that I would like to put before you, and that is his recognition that no society, this is a quotation, no society can be flourishing and happy if the greater part of its members are poor and miserable. So again, he was very conscious of the, of the social dilemma of what happens if the market builds up too much inequality. I want to make one final point. Uh, we've talked all about um, the economics of society and the, and the material well-being of people, although you draw that interesting distinction between uh, aspiration for something other than material well-being and pure, well, you, you, you aligned greed with, with material well-being. Um, there is an issue that the market and government finds difficult to deal with, which is looming for all of us. Um, and that is the way in which human aspirations for material well-being collectively, I might even say human greed collectively, us as a species, are gradually degrading the planet that we live on. Um, what I do now in London is I have the great honor of being the chair of the Natural History Museum there. And we have there, I don't know how many people here have visited the museum, we have a skeleton of a huge blue whale, now beautifully reset uh, in the central hall of the museum. The blue whale is the biggest creature that has ever lived, by far bigger than any dinosaur. Um, and that skeleton that's in the museum was washed, is the skeleton of a whale that was washed up in Ireland in, in 1890, um, at a time when there were a quarter of a million blue whales in the planet's oceans. Right. It was just at the time when commercial explosive harpoons were being developed, and the number of blue whales went down over the following decades from a quarter of a million to less than a thousand. They were right at the brink of extinction. And there are stories like that 
in so many areas of the human, of, of the planetary environment, and they are the result of okay. the human impact, uh, which you could call human greed vis-a-vis -vis the planet. Uh, I think there is some good news uh, uh, in that story, which I'm happy to come back to, okay. but I'll probably use my time up for now. Okay, all right. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, Gurcharan Das, I know you want to come in. Let me try to frame it in a way that doesn't just, again, like I said, restrict it to the realm of the theoretical. So while it's important to quote Adam Smith to, to contextualize right. him uh, in, in a way that doesn't misinterpret what he means, let me go back to my introduction, where essentially if the world is growing at 5% or, or whatever, whatever right. the current number is, why is then also inequality deepening? Yes. Yes, I think that is really the soft underbelly of capitalism. It has a tendency towards inequality. And, you know, it's, it, it, and it is a problem. I'm, I don't want to dismiss that problem. But in, for India, you know, we tend to take up the most fashionable debates that are taking place in the world and apply them to ourselves. And frankly, at this point in time in India, okay. you know, I would not obsess about inequality. I don't think the Chaiwala out there really cares whether Mukesh Ambani is filthy rich and he has got this huge big bungalow in uh, Bombay. I think that <clears throat> really for us at this point in time, we should be single-mindedly focused on the equality of opportunity. Right. That if every child in our country could get a decent education, sure. one of the successes of our country is that now we have all children are in school, right. but the education they get is a, re is a wretched education. So if we could give them health and education, right. you know, and really worry, that's where opportunity is. Okay. Instead of reservations and all these other things. Okay. So it's not, we should not even use the word inequality for a few years wow. in our country. Okay. I think we should only, we should find a way to measure opportunity, that everybody should have opportunity instead of measuring what is the gap between the 1% and the 80%. Right, let me, yeah. let me uh, Arun Mehra is yeah. itching to get in. I also Arun Mehra, and, yes, and then yes, I'll, yes, and I'll yes, come yes. to you. I think you know, yes. uh, you're right, uh, uh, we are dancing around with birds, but let's catch the bull by the horns, right? And Gurcharan has said, well, let's not agonize about the inequality of wealth. And maybe the Chaiwala doesn't bother about whether Mukesh Ambani has and the 20 kitchens in his house or, or not. Hmm? to do that. It's inequality of opportunity. How do you measure inequality of opportunity? The, if I might cite again, the Growth Commission, led by Michael Spence, 2009-10, economists from around the world were applying themselves to this question. What can we learn from the experiences of many countries that have grown very well, including China by then, to how economies can grow even faster. So give these lessons to policymakers in, sure. in governments. And what they found was in their discussions with policymakers and economists that they were getting very concerned about the decline in inclusion, not the growth in inclusion, but the decline in inclusion, which is why the inequality of wealth is coming up. And they said, we don't know yet how to manage inclusion growth while the economy is also growing, which came to the point again, what makes people feel excluded right. in many things? Access to power to influence their decisions, to be respected, to get dignity, and then in the buying the things. And I might just use this to say get concrete. We are using the word aspiration, and Dipankar used it too in, in advertising. We say in India we've got aspirational youth. Yes. Okay, they are buying, they wish to buy the better smartphone, the branded clothes, maybe a, a car, it's material things, and we call that aspirational. But when they're not getting opportunities, hmm. look what's happening to society. The violence in the city of Gurgaon, where I live, big aspirational community that we had created 15, 20 years ago, right. where people are being, well, women being dragged out of cars along with their husband and brother-in-law and raped on golf course road, 
Right. Okay. This Let's, is aspirational use. Okay. Ambi, Ambi Parmeshwaran, what's the point of talking about aspiration without opportunity? Let me flip it. You know, aspiration, I think uh, Mr. Mehra is talking about aspiration should be higher goals, etc. So let me flip the argument. You're talking about greed, right? So a poor guy is greedy for a job. Right? I mean, in one of the sessions yesterday, day before, someone stood up and said, look, all this is great, but you know, where is my job? Right? So greed can even be flipped that way. I mean, there's no harm in being greedy to get a job, to get an education, etc. Now you can say it is, is, it's aspiration, it's greed. So we are actually playing with words, right? So your question was, where are the opportunities, right? So that's the job of the that's government. That's, uh, the way, yeah. Yeah. that's the job of the government to you know, create opportunities. I don't think uh, just because, and I tend to agree with what Mr. Guchanda is saying, that we keep obsessing about inequality. Uh, should you really obsess this much about inequality? Because the last time we obsessed about inequality, we ended up with 80% income tax, okay, or 90% income tax, 97%. right? 97% income tax, right? So that was the last, that's where the inequality debate took us, right. uh, you know, 40 years ago. I don't, I don't think we should get there. But yeah, I think policy-wise, uh, it's good to see 98% of children in schools, but you know the reports are saying that fifth standard children in India, close to 50% of them, uh, can't do first standard math. So there is a problem with the quality of education. Okay. And, and that's an issue, which it's too big for me to talk about. Okay, I, I'll come to you in just a second. I'm, I'm trying to give opportunity equally to everyone. Yeah. Stephen Green, if I, can, if I can just bring you in on this interesting idea that opportunity and inequality are not necessarily linked. Because if you look at, for example, the arguments that are made about the way in which the banking system has been functioning, and this whole idea of offshore banking, is actually a way in which the rich and wealthy are avoiding paying taxes and are increasingly concentrating wealth in the hands of the fewer and fewer, which is denying the others opportunity. Now, I know you don't want to get into the specifics of it. Uh, you were associated with HSBC, and we're not getting into the specifics of any individual bank. But in a wider sense, then, um, how do you then make the argument that the two aren't linked? Uh, I wouldn't make the argument that the two aren't linked. I think they are. Um, I think it is very clear that inequality um, with... Uh, f first of all, two things clear. First of all, the system tends to generate inequality. I think that's established now beyond reasonable doubt. Thomas Piketty's book uh, does it very clearly. He wasn't the first to do it, but it became a bestseller. And I don't know who in this, uh, in this area has actually read Thomas Piketty's book from cover to cover. It's 800 pages long. Let me tell you, you can get the essence of it from about the last 25 pages. So that, uh, so that uh, uh, it is clear that the system has a tendency to create inequality. We can debate what the state can do about that, and clearly there are some things that the state can reasonably do about that. But to the question of whether we can simply separate inequality of wealth from inequality of opportunity, uh, I think they are linked. It's very clear that uh, uh, those who have more affluence are capable uh, of giving their children better education. That's the most obvious area in which uh, which inequality of, of, of wealth translates into inequality of opportunity. And I'm afraid the evidence is, in society after society, uh, that those who have the assets tend to be able to pass on the, if I can use the phrase, intellectual capital, onto their children, and so this perpetuates itself. Right. And this is not only true of, 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 a, of a developed country or a so-called developed country like the one I come from. Right. Uh, it is certainly true of India. I, I don't claim to know India in depth, but I know it quite well. Um, it's also true of China. And I think that's quite striking when you consider the background from which China came when it started to open up, it has created one of the most unequal societies in the world in one generation. Okay. Yes. So, you and know, then, uh, I think there's a link... Uh, 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 sorry. Yes. No, no, no. Yeah, you, the, you first. The, the lingering subtext of this session, uh, the way you framed it between greed and aspiration, you know, is a problem that of really the failure of socialism in the world. 
if the sin of capitalism is greed, the, failure, the sin of socialism was envy. And so all this conversation about inequality, I'm sorry to say, is partly a reflection of envy because the, the, the Marxists really believed that you had to make the rich poor in order to make the poor rich. And I think we've come a, a long way from that paradigm. Okay. The problem of socialism was not faith. We, are, we would all love that world, but the problem of socialism was performance. It did not work. And so I think, to me, frankly, the sin of envy is greater okay. than, it, it's a far baser human instinct right. than greed, if you, know, if, if, if you want to put it <laughs> quite as starkly as that. So in the so, seven deadly sins, you'd actually rate envy as worse on the scale than greed, is that right? Yeah, because what, what okay. you're doing in envy is you're trying to bring somebody down. Okay. Whereas in greed, at least you're trying to pull yourself up. Okay, that's, you know? I, I wish you'd said that at the beginning of the debate because that could have been another hour. Before I come to Dipankar, I want to ask you, you said that this is a result of the, Gurcharan, the failure of socialism. Is there any one country where you think capitalism has worked? And if so, which one would that be? Where capitalism has worked. Has worked, as it should work. Well, you know, there are capitalisms, obviously, and we all look to Scandinavia as the sort of ideal state where they keep the incentives of the market yes. and are still able to deliver huge equality of opportunity to the, 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 the people. And, and, and I, I feel actually you that... You say that the Scandinavian countries are capitalist countries? Oh, absolutely. You know, okay. in Denmark, you can hire a person in the morning and fire the person in the evening. Okay. But on the 21st day, that first go to the employment exchange and what he has to take the job that's offered or he has to go in for retraining. Okay. So that is the way that the, 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 these enviable Scandinavian countries have tried. Okay, interesting, to deal interesting with definition. Of, okay, everyone wants to just, jump in, just but to add, no, in, an, yeah, in an interesting way, Kerala is a great example of capitalism meets socialism, and it, and you know human development index in Kerala is fantastic, right? So, okay. Yeah, but right. there are no Dipankar. jobs. There, there are no jobs any, every, anywhere. There are no jobs anywhere. Are there jobs in Rajasthan? No, Kerala is worst. But their human development index is the highest. It's equal to Scandinavian countries. Okay, okay, okay. We're, we're getting sidetracked, Dipankar. Yeah, when we began this session, uh, Srinivasan said about gender, gender inequality. And the way the session has been going, I feel like a woman because I'm constantly being passed over. So I think, in a sense, we are achieving some kind of gender parity here. I'm sorry and for even that. Now, that wasn't even the intention. Now with, some, with some encouragement, I think, I kept prodding him to look my way, but he was looking at other men. <laughs> now, the, the thing is this. I had my eyes only for you, but they were not giving the mic up. You see, I, uh, what, I, what I think that this, this uh, session is about greed and aspiration, it's not a session, uh, not a one-on-one -on -one session on anti-Marxism. Because anti-Marxism is something that is so flogged, that it means nothing. If you want to do good Marxism, go read Marx. Please don't read all the trash around you. And if you read Marx properly, you'll find that many Marxists and some Marx is so important that capitalism has actually adopted them. If you're talking about Norway, Sweden, Denmark, what have they done? They've taken the last, second last page from Marx's Communist Manifesto and made it work in a sensible way. And that's what it has done. When you're talking about inequality of opportunity, this kind of thing really riles me, you know, and, and gets me working. We're talking inequality of opportunity. Let's have that. Do you know in the best societies in the world today, where there's the least inequality, are the societies which have the greatest opportunity. 
It is not the other way around. It is inequality that brought in these societies to go in for equality of opportunity. It is not as if they sort of felt that inequality of opportunity is a good thing in itself. Not at all. It began with inequality of opportunity. And look at all the places where inequality of opportunity has been actually combated. It was combated during the worst times in those societies. It was combated when Britain was so darn poor it couldn't hold on to India. It was combated in Sweden, when Sweden was so poor that a million Swedes went to America, the most Swedes in Minnesota than in Sweden. And that is the real point, that you don't begin by saying things like, let's talk about inequality of opportunity, forget about inequality of wealth. That is not true, number one. Number two, it is not simply inequality of wealth, it is the terrible poverty that surrounds us everywhere. This terrible poverty can only be overcome by aspirations. We were talking about educational report. The educational report says that yes, Class 8 students can't do things that class 3 students can do. Fine. Very bad news. But look at it the other way around. Students are enrolling in droves because they have aspirations. The hopeless school exudes hope. And that is what's most important. And people like us don't pay attention to that. Why should a child who goes to school does not get what the style should get out of school? Why don't we pay attention to that? That is the most important thing. Why does my father or mother, when they go to hospital, don't get the attention the hospital should give them? That is what, it, what matters the most. If you're thinking okay. of one minute, if you're thinking of aspirations... I'm not saying anything. I'm sorry. If you're thinking of aspirations and human greed and need, you have to get your question right. It begins with inequality, begins with economic injustice, and that is what really counts. You can take lots of, lots of bad examples, 93% taxes and all that stuff, but that's not, that's not in, intrinsic to the system. What is intrinsic system is greed is a universal phenomenon. If you don't believe me, take up the Rig Veda, him one, him five, him eight, and no advertisement, ad advertisement break in between. You'll see greed written large. But the fact of the matter is, while greed has been universal throughout history, aspiration is a phenomenon of today. An aspiration phenomenon of today, please pay attention to it. Don't brush it aside. Okay, if I may now. Dipankar, I'll, I'll come to you in a second. If I could just ask Dipankar a follow-up question then, Dipankar. So then... So now he recognizes me. <laughs> to your point that these aspirations are not being met, who would you then hold accountable to that? The government. I think, I think uh, Arun was absolutely right. You cannot have prior capitalism run riot and amok. Everybody knows that. Even the most, uh, ad most ardent advocate of capitalism will tell you exactly this. If we let capitalism on its own, it's going to destroy itself because it's going to be completely consumed by its own greed. Greed is self-destructive. Aspiration is, is something that people aspire to to get better. Okay. Aspiration is betterment. Greed is self-destructive. Now, if you want this capitalism to work well, then you have to incorporate elements of socialism. And for that, you have to read the right text and not the wrong ones. And you must remember, as he said, that the government must play an important role. The regulatory aspect of the government. If a government plays a bad role, like 97% tax, 93% tax, things are going to go under. And you can't pick, pick that up and say socialism is bad, because that's bad socialism, bad capitalism, bad governance. Okay. We'll have a, a last word from Arun Mehra, who wanted to come in, and then we'll go to questions. So, so please start framing your questions. Thank you. You know, uh, I, I'm uh, really intrigued always by the nature of the debate that we have when we want to improve our society in all aspects. We do want people to have more material goods because many of our people don't even have the basic necessities. We do want people who have equal opportunity, equal dignity, because many people in our country don't have that. Okay? We want all these things together and different sorts of things together. And in the system, one sort of thing influences the way the other goes. Right. Our equality of opportunity to influence the rules of the game influences whether I'll be able to get my children into good schools or not, and thereafter, the wealth can get equalized or not, depending on my ability. Okay. So to, to characterize a person who says that I believe that we have to rethink capitalism as, oh, so you're anti-growth, you live in the past ages, you're socialist, and describing a socialist only as an economic phenomena, where social is about society, it's about improving the quality of society. Okay. So let's uh, just examine more carefully and deeply and not make it black and white. Okay, all right. Stephen, I know, I know you wanted to come in, but we have to have time for questions, so hopefully we'll have some questions uh, directed at all of you. Okay, let's uh, try and start at the back, as always. Can we uh, get a mic to a gentleman who's literally on his feet? So, if you could just keep your question short and also frame questions, 
not statements. Yeah. My question is, uh, will the policies adopted by the present regime decrease the inequality of the opportunities? Will the policies of the present regime will decrease the inequality of opportunities when most of the budget is spent in a way that the richer will benefit, for example, uh, physical and social infrastructure is being de developed uh, in a way. Okay. Dipankar, would you like to take that question? He's overdoing it now. <laughs> yeah, when you talk about inequality and what the budget is all about, I want to ask you a simple question. And that is this, have you ever seen a politician of repute, or not, of not much significance, even that, who stands outside a hospital even for a photo op? Never. No politicians have ever been in front of a hospital looking at those lines of people who are there seeking desperately some help. There's nobody there. Nobody. So if you're talking about inequality of opportunity and inequality in general, let me tell you this. In a country that spends less than 1% on, of its GDP on health, around 3% on education, forget about it. You will never get it. The only way to get it is to actually up your, your, your expenditure on these items, to think of these things as necessary and important and central to the citizen, not central to this government, this, this bureau, bureaucrat or that capitalist or that section of the population, but to the universal aspect of society and citizenship. Otherwise, it will not work. Your, your, your hope will will only come to fruition if our health and education expenditures go up. Okay. Uh, can we have it to, uh, yeah, the ladies here in front. Uh, I want, uh, hello, is this audible? Yeah, I want to ask the, uh, I want to ask if the government uses, like, the giving opportunities to people and privatize it, like giving education to the poor, it hire a private company and just supervise it. Will it work uh, in a country like India? Who wants uh, to take that? Yeah, okay, I, I would say that, you know, really, there's a famous saying from China, let our all flowers bloom. And so the best we can do Today, as I think what your subtext of your question is a very large number of people, including the poor, are abandoning government schools and going into private schools. And many of these private schools are not very good private schools. And so the job of the government actually is to not run schools, but to enable schools to be run. In other words, give the incentives whether and, do, and to have competition between the government schools and the private schools, and therefore th that would bring accountability. So I think it's not either or. What we have is a, is, is a sort of hypocrisy where the people, the government's officials send their own children to private schools, but they want the rest, the poor, everybody, to send their children to government schools. Okay. So really, the best thing would be yeah. really what is called, a, I would have a universal scholarship system. Every child you reach the age of five, instead of putting the money into government schools, give the child the money right. to go to any school that the child okay. can go, go to. Go Charandas. Uh, you quickly wanted to come in on yeah, that. I want to quick, Should uh, government quick, not be in the business of uh, running a, schools? A quick comment, and, and not about India. That would be presumptuous of me. Um, but it, but it, it, it begs an interesting question. Um, uh, I come from a country where the bulk of uh, children are educated in a state system, but I think I'm right in saying that something like 10 or 15% of children are educated in the private sector. The key point is not just about competition. It's uh, the government has a responsibility to ensure quality. So in, in Britain, there is an independent quality assessor of the schools. Now, I have no idea what the position in India is, but I do think that's an important part of the government's responsibility, okay. not just to promote competition, but to ensure quality. Okay, can we uh, go to the back? And uh, I'm trying to see if I can spot any ladies only to try to rectify this inequality, the gender inequality. Yeah, there's a lady there. 
Um, hello, I'm Srujana. I, I was just wondering, like, don't you think that most of the inequality arises because of inheritance rights? And if we could just like ban inheritance rights, then everyone would be at a um, equal level and would rise according upon their own merit. Okay, the, I think the question was about banning inheritance rights. Am I correct that if you were to ban inheritance rights, that would lead to greater equality in societies? Anyone wants to wants to feel that? I just to say, there's a philosophical yes. question here. If you say that uh, every child is born equal as a human being, and every child on birth should have an equal opportunity, then a principle that your father or your grandfather having been a more successful, by own merits, person has passed on to this child an unequal opportunity vis-a-vis -vis others. So there's a philosophical question here goes down there. And that is why this business about inheritance taxes is always a very fraught issue. Because you have the right to your property and do what you will with it, including gifting it to your children. But on the other hand, doesn't it make an unequal society? Okay. Dipanka, you had a point. Yeah, because, uh, you know, this is a subject with fraught with all kinds of difficulties and misinterpretations are possible. But to repeat myself, which I love doing, there's, a, there's something that I said earlier, and that is this. Uh, a, a definition of citizenship from T.H. Marshall, which is that, Citizenship confers an equality of status at base upon which structures of inequality may be built. So citizenship is not about equality at the end, it's about equality at the beginning. And that's what matters. Okay, let me go to more questions. I know all of you want to come in on this, but it's nice to uh, make it a little more interactive. Let's again go to the back. Can we uh, get the gentleman there at the back with the beard? Thank you. If the governments are supposed to provide for good education and good health. Would you recommend that most or perhaps all government officials and politicians in power must send their children to government schools and send themselves to government hospitals for health? <laughs> Only then the conditions will improve. Okay. No, I, I want to, I, please, I want to come in there. Okay. Oh, I you know, we're talking about the government people, no, I want to say. Yeah. Actually, Finland has the best education system in the world. On the South Asian uh, continent, the South Asian uh, subcontinent, Bhutan has the best education system in the world. In both these education systems, everyone, in case of Bhutan, even the king's children, go to the same schools. In Finland, is one school system. So, we wealthy people are opting out of the system. Don't keep jumping on the government. Where do we send our children? If we were as rich people, richer people, to use public services, we'd put pressure on the government to improve those public services. Okay. We've opted out. Okay. Ambi, do you want to come in on that? You've not. You know, okay. I mean, You've just, not had a chance just, to. I can say just a quick one. Very, yeah. very quickly. Very quickly, all of us would love for the government education system, schools and hospitals to improve. We've been waiting 70 years for that to happen. Okay. It has not happened. All so right. meanwhile, let's accept the reality that today, half the children of India, is the highest in the world, right. are in private schools. Okay. So instead of just saying that again and again we must improve government schools, let's actually deal with the reality that okay. those schools are not functioning and try to find other solutions. Okay, all right. It's not happened for 50 years. Maybe it'll happen after this panel discussion. Can we get this uh, lady here in front? Thank you. So coming back to advertising. So in my opinion, advertising pushes more upon wants rather than needs. So would you count it as a criticism for advertising or it's mere job? Like I would want a smartphone, but advertising would make me want an iPhone X. So would, could you please comment on that? Well, advertising is about, at one level, educating consumers, helping them understand you know, what, what they can do with their various things, right? So at one stage, I'm, I'm right. I mean, iPhone X is an extreme example of a, whatever, 90,000 rupee phone. Uh, but if you look at 90% of advertising, at least in a country like India, is really catering to 
the basic wants and educating the consumer to wash their hands, wash their mouth, wash, you know, we are doing very, very basic level advertising in this country because a large percentage of our country, children don't wash their hands before they, you know, have their food. They don't, you know, I saw an ad for a, for a toilet cleaner the other day, which addressed a huge sociological problem in this country that you, have, you can build toilets, but who cleans the toilets? So, the, you know, a upper caste person doesn't clean the toilet. So there was a brand, which I think advertised here, which is one of our sponsors here, said that, look, use this particular toilet cleaner and you can clean the toilet without really a problem. And I think, therefore, advertising is performing. I started first, so I'll end by saying advertising is performing a service in this country to help consumers understand how to use new products, new services okay. to become better citizens and better human beings. Yeah. Okay, I have time for just one more question, I'm told. So if you can go to someone there at the back. Sorry, we have to, we have to be uh, a little democratic here. So any, any, yeah. Go ahead, sir. My question to Mr. Dipangu Gupta is, how can socialism and capitalism go hand in hand? Socialism and capitalism go hand in hand. Oh dear, we'll be here another hour, but anyway. Let's, <laughs> let's. There's a one hour let's, lecture coming up. We'll, We'll have a quick response from the banker. Well, you know, I'll, I'll deny myself the 55 minutes and, and do it in a few seconds. And that is this. You know, when Soviet Union collapsed, somebody from Guardian came over to India and he wanted to meet leftover socialists. And he came from the Guardian newspaper. And they wanted to meet some leftover leftists. And they came to meet me. And I said to them that I, now that Soviet Union has failed, I can proudly say I'm a Marxist. All this time, it was an incubus. So if you're saying that socialism and capitalism, I don't really care. What matters to me is, are these governments delivering the goods? As far as I can see, the best government that's delivering the good are those in Northern Europe, and they're doing a good job. Where they call themselves socialists or capitalists is irrelevant to me. But what is most important is that they have a socialist frame of mind as they go into capitalism. Okay, Stephen Green, 10 seconds, <laughs> otherwise ten, we'll ten, be 10 in seconds from a very interesting character. Deng Xiaoping in China said, capitalism has its plans, why shouldn't socialism have its markets? And he said that at the time when China was beginning to open up. You asked a question a little earlier, where has capitalism worked? Answer, nowhere perfectly. But one thing's for sure is it has delivered for hundreds of millions of Chinese a huge growth in their standard of living. Okay, all right, we're completely out of time. Thank you all for being a great panel, a terrific audience. Thanks very much indeed. Bye. Thank you so much for the